Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shani Jardin. Uh, I'm one of the founders, uh, well, I'm one of the, the editors of uh, boingboing.net, uh, a funny sounding blog that uh, sometimes covers serious things, uh, like we were live blogging from the genocide trial. Um, I also uh, teamed up with my partner, Miles O'Brien, to produce a series of reports for the PBS NewsHour from Guatemala. Uh, and we were down there. Um, for about six weeks, observing the trial and interviewing uh, victims, interviewing uh, people like Patrick Ball and Pamela Yates and Kate Doyle and some of the other people that you see here, and also interviewing people like uh, Zuri Rios and Harris Whitbeck, and um, it, it, it was an interesting experience. Uh, this afternoon, I am, am very honored to be here uh, to uh, moderate this conversation with uh, Benjamin Manuel Geronimo, who uh, is from a community uh, called Rabinal. Um, his family is Achi Maya, they are Achi speakers. And uh, one afternoon during the trial, uh, I, I literally sat at his feet while he, um, while he gave a speech. All of us press were kind of crowded around his feet. We were listening to him speak. I think it was on May May 9th or May 10th, and he uh, he delivered this beautiful speech. I, I just want to read you the, the last couple of lines of this. I I wish I could 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 fully explain how emotional it was uh, to listen to this inside the genocide trial. He he ended his speech uh, before the court. He said, "We are not looking for vengeance. We are looking for a true peace, with justice, with respect, with equality, with dignity." That is why we're here. So I ask you once again, he said to the court, the moral reparations to the victims, the protection of the witnesses, of our lawyers, that all of the Maya people be respected and protected. And then he said, it is written that it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for un rico genocido, a rich genocidal person, to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And I remember when he finished that speech, just everybody on, well, on the side of the Yishil leapt to their feet and just screamed and clapped. And, you know, you, you might add another line that it is also easier for a camel to pass through an eye of the needle than, than it is to actually uh, have a, a conviction that holds for a rich genocidal person. Uh, also with us this afternoon, again, a, a great honor to welcome Roddy Brett, who is a lecturer for the Center of Peace and Conflict Studies at the School of International Relations at the University of St. Andrews. Uh, he is a scholar uh, who's lived for the last 12 years in um, in Latin America. He's a, an advisor to the United Nations High Commission for Human Rights in Guatemala. Uh, and he's an advisor to the UNDP in Guatemala and to the United Nations Peace Unit in Colombia. Those two countries obviously have, have some interesting things in common. He prepared a special witness report for cases against Rios Mont and Lucas Garcia on the Ishil Maya people, uh, who were at the center of this trial, as, as I think most of you here know, uh, and on Ishkan for Caldeache. Uh, he's a specialist in human rights, genocide, indigenous peoples, peace processes, and the author of no fewer than eight books on the subject. Welcome to you, Roddy. So, um, you know, the, 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 the theme of our conversation this afternoon is on building peace after genocide. And I imagine that if you, if you pose this, this theme to a number of people in Guatemala, you know, they would say, well, well what peace and what after? Because uh, you, know, you could easily make the argument that the genocide, um, the genocide didn't end. Yes, the mass killings uh, in the sense that they happened during the time of Rios Mont have ended. Uh, but one could argue, and in fact, uh, uh, there are indigenous groups who argue today that, that like the, uh, the extractive industries, the mining the, uh, in, in San Rafael and those four communities that are under state of siege, that were placed under state of siege, military occupation during the trial, that this kind of activity is a form of genocide as well. And uh, I, I thought maybe it would be nice to begin by asking Benjamin Geronimo um, for his thoughts on, well, all that has happened since that day, since he gave that beautiful speech, uh, the conviction, the effective overturning of the conviction, and where we go from here to, to pursue uh, peace after genocide. And we do have a translator here. Bueno, eh, muchas gracias por el espacio de llegar hasta acá. 
un pueblo para mí pues un pueblo muy admirable Thank you so para much. mí por la distancia pero Thank you so much for giving me the space to come here to talk to you. Um, it's very important for me to be here. Pero por mis finado, por las víctimas, por los sobrevivientes, hemos llegado acá. For my family members, for the victims, for the survivors, that's why we're here today. Me decía un licenciado que para contar un poquito lo de ahora, es necesario contar un poco lo de antes. And in order to talk about what's going on right now, we still have to talk about what happened before. Mi experiencia que nos dejó el genocidio. The experience that the genocide has left for me. Después que fue la masacre, perdí 14 miembros de mi, de mi familia. After the massacre, I lost 14 members of my family. No echando, no incluyendo mi, mis abuelos, mis tíos, mi sobrino. And that doesn't include my grandparents or my aunts, uncles, nieces, or nephews. Después, para construir la paz después del genocidio, And so after, in order to build peace after genocide, después que nos quedamos solos, cuatro hermanos varones de mi familia, the four brothers that were left, the, the four of us, Nos tuvimos que unirnos, organizarnos. We had to unite and we had to organize ourselves. Para ver qué se puede hacer. To figure out what we could do. Desde 1985, Siete años o seis años después de la masacre, después del genocidio, nos tuvimos que unirnos para ver si se puede denunciar lo que nos habían hecho. So in, in 1995, seven years after the massacre, after the genocide, we got together to try to figure out how to organize ourselves and, and do something and denounce what had happened. Y gracias a las organizaciones internacionales seguramente eh, por el tiempo ya no los conozco pero han llegado varios en mi comunidad and donde nos acompañaron and thanks to the, the international community who came to help us to accompany us um, it was it was really them who were there to, to give us support and accompany us in this process y ellos son los que nos dieron fuerza para poder denunciar. And they gave us the strength to be able to denounce what had happened. Para presentar nuestras denuncias en el Ministerio Público. And to, pr um, to present the, the denouncement of what had happened um, formally at the, the public prosecutor's office. Mi experiencia de llegar en este caso, en este momento, sobre el, el caso colectivo del genocidio en Guatemala, And so my experience with this collective process of looking for justice for genocide in Guatemala. También fui, fui queriantes del caso de mi propia comunidad, de 256 miembros de mi comunidad. I also represented the, the members of my community, of the 200 some uh, members of my community. Donde fueron eh, con, condenados cinco miembros tres miembros del ejército, ex soldado, eh, un jefe comisionado y un judicial de la G2. Um, where five different um, military officials were condemned um, and they each have different 
a fueron condenados eh, con 780 años por asesinato. And they were each condemned for 780 years for murder. Y así eh, nos fuimos organizando ya, eh, se fue formando la, la Asociación para la Justicia y Reconciliación AJR en Guatemala. And this is how we started our um, organizing by forming the Association for Justice and Reconciliation in Guatemala. Donde tiene cobertura en cinco regiones del país donde su sucedieron las masacres. Uh, that is represented by five regions in Guatemala where the massacres occurred. En 2009 también fue representante legal de la Asociación para la Justicia, AJR en Guatemala. In 2009, I was also the representative for the AJR, the Association for Justice and Reconciliation in Guatemala. En 2011 también fui eh, como reelecto, solo descansé dos años para ser nuevamente el representante legal de la Asociación para la Justicia y and Reconciliación. Then, And then in 2011, I was reelected, so I only had two years to relax um, before they called me again to represent them. Y eh, una compañera que era eh, expresidente que salió cuando yo recibí en 2011, ella fue la que hizo capturas en contra de los miembros, los responsables intelectuales, intelectuales del genocidio en Guatemala. And with my compañera, who was then the president of the AJR, um, she was in charge of it uh, when they issued the arrest warrants against um, Rios Montt. Seguidamente, eh, continuamos, como se llama, con el, con el proceso, eh, donde eh, acom con acompañamiento de nuestros abogados de Caldeach, eh, el año 2012 12, se habían quedado unos eh, recursos eh, pendientes, eh, impuestos, o sea, este, propuestas por los eh, abogados defensores de los responsables de las masacres. And so we were always represented by Caldeache, our, our legal representatives in the case. In 2012, the legal representatives of the defense tried to put forward Um, these legal stays on the case um, that Caldeache had to um, work around. El 11 de, de enero empezamos nuevamente ya eh, concluyendo con los eh, recursos que habían dejado, se había quedado el año 2012. In January 11th, um, all of those legal stops had been resolved and the case would move forward in 2012. Y eh, también eh, en el 2012 eh, los abogados defensores pusieron, eh, interpusieron eh, más de 100 recursos, donde el 95% fueron, les fueron rechazados, les fueron negados y fueron eh, resueltos a favor nuestra, de las víctimas. In 2012, the defense lawyers put forward more than 100 uh, injunctions or legal stops trying to halt the process in which over 95% were found, um, were rejected out of hand, um, that there was no basis for them. De esa manera, eh, tuvimos, eh, logramos avanzarnos para llegar eh, en la fase intermedia, es donde se entregan las pruebas, donde se solicita eh, se entrega eh, eh, los documentos eh, elaborados por ellos para cometer la masacre. Uh, and after overcoming that obstacle, we were able to move into the debate phase or the, the actual case um, hearing in the courts, which um, opened the way for showing the evidence and having the testimonies uh, to prove that there had occurred these massacres. Y gracias a, a un varón guatemalteco eh, que se llama eh, Miguel Ángel Galvez, que fue el que recibieron, recibió las pruebas eh, en contra de los responsables. 
and thanks to um, a young man named Miguel Angel Galvez. Miguel Angel Galvez, um, there was very tangible proof um, to advance the case forward. Terminamos con las los recursos que había que tenía en su mano y luegamente lo trasladó el documento, los expedientes al tribunal de sentencia. And he was able to um, turn in all of the evidence, and once the evidence had been presented, the case um, moved forward into uh, the final decision-making moment. Seguidamente, eh, el tribunal de sentencias nos notificó que el debate oral y público se iba a empezar el 14 de, de agosto de este año. We were originally informed that uh, the trial would open on the 14th of August of this year. Pero por el, la magnitud y la gravedad del caso. But because of the magnitude and the gravity of the case. La jueza, los tres jueces, una mujer Valien, dos mujeres valientes, guatemaltecas, y un varón a la par también valiente. Se apuraron para continuar con el debate oral y público. The judges, two very brave women and one very brave man, decided to speed up the process and, and move it along more quickly. Seguramente ellos pensaron de que si se dejaba hasta para esta fecha, el 14 de enero. Um, agosto, ¿no? Uh, perdón, they, agosto, perdón, agosto. They, they probably thought that if they waited until the 14th of August, los abogados defensores podrían, tienen el tiempo para meter, meter o interponer otros 100 recursos para detener el caso. That the defense lawyers would take that time to put in another 100 injunctions uh, to stop the case. Pero por la valentía de las dos mujeres y el varón, Empezamos el 19 de marzo. But because of the courage of the two judge women and the, the male judge, we were able to start um, in March. Y desde el 19 de marzo también empezaron a poner otros recursos, otros amparos, apelaciones, recusaciones en contra de los abogados, en contra de los jueces, perdón. And the, the defense immediately started trying to put in other uh, stops, stays, injunctions, anything to stop uh, the judges from being able to hold the trial. Y gracias a Dios, tampoco eh, lograron, sino, sino que también eh, la actitud, la valentía y el entendimiento de entender la, nuestra constitución guatemal, guatemalteca, los convenios y tratados internacionales por los tres jueces, fue a favor nuestra. But because of um, their courage and their understanding of the Guatemalan constitution and international treaties and conventions, the judges ruled in favor of us. Finalmente, las sentencias logramos el 10 de, de mayo este año. And we, we won the sentence on the 10th of May this year. Y en el momento de que estábamos enfrente, yo como representante legal, eh, vi todas las, eh, las actuaciones de los abogados defensores. And in the moment that that happened, I was the legal representative. I was in front of everything um, as the, a protagonist. Porque fueron como niños ante el, ante el tribunal. I saw that the defense lawyers um, and party um, acted like children in front of the tribunal. No pudieron defender a su al general, sino al final, en vez de defenderlas, 
más lo fueron a acusar de todo lo hecho. I can second that I was there. <laughs> Esa es la alegría para la asociación. That they saw that they couldn't defend the generals and so they left. Y al final salieron corriendo. They left running. Porque ya no hayaban que decir. Because they had nothing they could say. Pero en Guatemala se maneja siempre la impunidad. But in Guatemala there is always impunity. Eh, la corte más alta de Guatemala lo anula una parte de la sentencia. And the highest court in Guatemala annulled a part of the sentence. La semana ante la semana pasada. Last week. Y eso es el, el riesgo que tenemos la situación que tenemos ahorita, la preocupación, perdón. And that's the concern that we have right now. Como asociación, como sobrevivientes, como eh, abogados, jueces, fiscales. As the association, as the victims, as the survivors, as the lawyers, as the society. Porque seguramente si se si anula por completo el, 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 el juicio y esperamos que no, pues eh, el ejército nuevamente se se va a instalar, o sea, se está instalando, pero no ha podido poner bien las manos porque todavía están, eh, hay algo que no está, que no está viendo, hay algo que no está acompañando para no dejar, para no permitir que, que no alulen por completo. And we, we just, we can't let them annul total, all of the case, all of the sentence, because that would allow the military to do what it did before and already it's installing itself in communities. Um, we need this precedent so that the military can't just repeat what it has done in the past. So uh, our, our time is limited during the session. I want to uh, give Professor Brett a moment to, to respond to some of what uh, Benjamin Geronimo was just saying. When we were in the court, I remember part of your speech, you, you spoke about um, a, a request uh, or a, de a demand that the army stop occupying indigenous communities, something that was renewed in a new way during the trial itself. Uh, Professor Brett, can you take us back? How was peace built after uh, the peace accords, after, 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 after the genocide as it was defined for this trial ended? And how effective was that? Okay. Thanks, Jenny. And thanks for coming. Muchas gracias. Mm. Um, I think the short answer is that it wasn't built. I think peace hasn't been built in Guatemala um, for many reasons. I think, first of all, there wasn't even any significant agreement on the, on the meta-conflict. And by what I mean by that is really what the conflict was about, what it meant, what it, how it was defined, and in terms of the fact that whether or not it was a genocide. And clearly what's happened over the last few months specifically is, has demonstrated that. So what does that mean? Well, I think it means that post-authoritarian change has been shallow. And I think that's also, and this is an important point, that's what makes the achievement of Caldeache and the Ajoteere so important, right? Because of the context in which it's taken place. And getting Rios Munt and Sanchez Rodriguez to, to the courtroom. So I think in terms of the piece, how I would see it is that it's really it was a peace process that never engaged with the root causes of armed conflict. It was a peace process that debated and negotiated everything with the exception of that, right? Um, it was a peace process that was effectively, I think, despite the important struggles of civil society organizations, without those struggles, we wouldn't even have got to that peace process, I don't think. Or at least it would have been a very different peace process, but I think that it was a peace process that was imposed upon a very reticent and reluctant elite, right? And clearly that's been demonstrated today, and it's that elite today that still has a Cold War mentality, right? Um, it's that elite that never exercised any ownership over the peace process. Um, so I think one of the most acute weaknesses of the peace process has clearly been the fact that we failed in terms of achieving one of the principal goals of a peace process, which was reconciliation. 
Um, and I think, well, clearly, as we know, historical and legal truth is still being debated. The perpetrators have never assumed responsibility for what they did in any way whatsoever. Um, and I think an important point here is that before rights mechanisms can actually, human rights mechanisms or normative frameworks can actually apply to individuals or collective groups, these individuals and collective groups must be recognized as humans, right? as rights bearers, as deserving as, of rights. And that hasn't happened in Guatemala. Precisely, I think, one of the key elements of what Martha was saying because of racism. So that is a, an ex essential building block that we need to overcome 30 years after the massacres. 16, 17 years after the end of the peace process, right? So that so would be... still working with a state that doesn't define them fully as human absolutely beings. Absolutely right. No, so that would be the first point. The second point I want to make is that in that regard, what I think the current crisis, if you want to call it that, with the trial demonstrates, okay, it certainly demonstrates a weak judicial system, um, weak institutionality, impunity, which has been re have been recurring problems in Guatemala. But clearly for me, the crisis with the trial demonstrates the absolute failure of the peace process in that regard, okay? Um, and impunity for genocide, as we will see and are seeing, and for crimes against humanity, what that means and what that brings about is validation for such crimes. Literally, these crimes are validated. There's no sanction for them, okay? Which ends up, I think, further dehumanizing indigenous peoples um, and bringing about, as I think some, of, some other people mentioned, the distinct possibility of repetition in the future, okay, in one way or another. Um, and as I think we were talking on the phone yesterday, Jenny, I mean, what people in various parts of Guatemala have said recently is with the state of siege and the military interventions, it's like the 1980s all over again, as we were saying yesterday, right? So I think that's crucial. So I think we haven't yet, in what is essentially a highly unconsolidated, violent, fragile, pernicious, hybrid democracy in Guatemala, we haven't reached that level of irre irreversibility of rights guarantees. Okay? And just, just to finish, or to, 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 to conclude with that, in terms of what the future might hold, I guess, um, I think we're probably all in agreement that the trial could inevitably have represented quite a crucial building block to build a state and for reconciliation. And I think that the crucial gains have been achieved really because of what Otto was saying earlier on, civil society, the role of civil society, the role of victims of, and survivors organizations, the election of Claudia Paz, clearly. Um, and this is a trial that I think, despite how a lot of internationals have played a really crucial role in the trial, it's a homegrown Guatemalan trial. And I want to put that right on the table. That's okay. the biggest historic aspect here is this is the first time in history that a former head of state was placed on trial for genocide and crimes against humanity in a domestic court yeah. in that same nation. The, and, and a trial that isn't driven by the state, that mm -hmm. isn't, isn't pushed as some transitional justice processes have been, but it's pushed by survivors, and that's crucial. So what does that mean? Well, I think it means a few things. I think clearly we need to ask ourselves whether or not we actually have the risk of losing ground as a result of this trial. Um, do we? I don't know. It's a debatable point. The second question I, I think I'd like to ask is, is it only a genocide if a court of law says it's only a genocide? Says it's a genocide? I don't think it is. Right? And I, I've spent 10 years accompanying the Ajotere and Caldeche and working in this trial and having listened to the stories, and we, we all know them, um, and the experiences of what happened. So I guess what the point I'd like to make is how do we start engaging with the fact that what would have, what came out on the 10th of May, and what may come out again, depending on what happens, is a legal truth. And that's one kind of truth, but we have other truths, right? So a legal truth is inevitably a, a partial truth. And I think, as, as, as certain people have said, the damage has been done to the elite. So literally to finish, um, in terms of continuity, okay? Because I think clearly what we've seen are the massacres and what happened in the, in the court recently is really shaped by the weight of history, okay? And by that so-called Indian threat and by racism, as Marta was saying. So what we've seen is generally, and I say generally um, because it's not, it's not necessarily the case, whilst the massacres or the systematic massacres have stopped, generally stopped, um, obviously Totonicapan, San Rafael, 
in other parts of Guatemala massacres are continuing, particularly related to international and national extractive industries and the imposition of those in Guatemala's pernicious peace, um, I think whilst, that's, whilst massacres have finished, what we see today is indigenous people are still dying of preventable diseases, of hunger. Um, they are systematically having their right to autonomy violated. So I guess my question would be, is the normative framework that talks about genocide enough? Right? And do we need to start thinking about defining, preventing, and how, how we define, prevent, and punish what's going on today in Guatemala? Is it a cultural genocide? Is it ethnocide? How do we understand it? And how do we think about a normative framework that would engage with that? Um, and the last point, really, would be how do we also start thinking about the role of international actors? Because clearly it's a double-edged sword, right? Um, the Guatemalan elite constantly play the sovereignty card when it suits them. And I think if we all remember in 2006, I think it was June 2006, when Santiago Pedras went to Guatemala, maybe it's 2007, um, and was basically had to leave with his tail between his legs because the Guatemalan authorities would not um, cooperate, saying that literally, I remember the front page of Plensa Libre um, said that the, el trabajo de los españoles se terminó aquí en 1821. Right? So the work of the, of the Guatemalans finished here in 1821. Sovereignty. That same week, and this is crucial, that same week, the Guatemalan authorities signed the last elements of the free trade agreement with the US. So how do we engage with this? And, and the questions that supposedly De La Nese from uh, CSIG resigned yesterday relating to what he had allegedly said about um, various people involved in the genocide trial. So I think there are lots of challenges that really lie ahead, both conceptual but also obviously on the ground practical activist struggles. So I'm getting some very emphatic cues that we need to wrap up, but I do want to give uh, Benjamin Geronimo the last word here. Sir, what would you say to concerned American audiences who would like to support uh, the, the struggle of the victims of these abuses? How do we help organizations like AJR build peace after genocide? However that genocide ends up being defined and, and by whom? La verdad, pues, eh, nosotros como asociación, pues, necesitamos eh, primeramente el acompañamiento internacional, porque eh, la verdad, eh, yo quiero ser sincero de que se ha ganado la, la, la sentencia en Guatemala por la presencia, ¿cómo se llama?, de, de la, del organismo internacional. Eh, what I first want to say is that um, it's what we really need is the international community to be present and to accompany us because what we've achieved in the trial, uh, what we achieved in the sentence was thanks to the fact that international allies have been accompanying us. Entonces, eh, le dejamos esta recomendación. Eh, quisiéramos eh, pedirles el, la solidaridad de acompañamiento internacional para que también eh, miren los, los acusados y los familiares de que si sí hay presencia, aunque ahorita en Guatemala está fuerte, ¿cómo se llama? La amenaza en contra de la, la, la organismo internacional. So what, what we continue to ask for is for the international community to be present, to show solidarity, to accompany the process, um, so that when the, the military officials and their families look around, they see that the international community is paying attention um, and that... Um, que nosotros eh, somos unos parásitos, estamos comiendo por, por, por las, eh, la presencia o posee las organizaciones interna internacionales, pero la verdad no es eso, nosotros estamos buscando una justicia verdadera, una paz, un futuro mejor para nuestros hijos, un cambio de... Para Guatemala, eso es lo que nosotros buscamos. And that this actually is coming at a time when it's, it's increasingly harder for international organizations and solidarity to, to be as visible in Guatemala. Um, they're accused, or they accuse us of being parasites, of living off of the international community. And it's not true. What we want is peace in Guatemala. We want the best for our communities. We want justice. Um, we want equality. 
también eh, muy poco la, la participación de nuestras víctimas, porque están de una distancia de 200, 300 kilómetros de nuestra eh, ciudad capital. Entonces, cuando hay audiencias, eh, no podemos, no tenemos la capacidad para movilizar un, un cientos o miles de personas para que vengan a presenciar el, el, el debate o las audiencias. Entonces, por la sencilla razón que no tenemos recursos eh, financieros para poder eh, sensibilizar en las comunidades y con la misma poder presenciar en las, en las audiencias. Entonces, también les sugeremos, ustedes que eh, tal vez tienen más eh, espacios también que nos apoyen eh, fin, eh, económicamente para poder seguir con este, con este proceso. No, lo que um, and also, given that many of the people who have been affected, that are the survivors, that are the protagonists in this struggle, live 100 kilometers, 200 kilometers from the capital and don't have the ability to travel to the hearings, um, it's very difficult for us to transport a thousand people, um, which is only a fraction of the people who have been affected, um, to to be able to witness these hearings. Um, and it's hard for us to come back to the community and be able to tell everyone what exactly happened. So another way that the international community could really help, given that there are more resources and we really do not have them to be able to, to mo mobilize people, is that the international community help um, financially so that we can help uh, bring the message back to the communities in which we live and continue this fight. Hay mucho que contar, pero el tiempo es muy limitado, entonces les agradezco mucho y esperamos que, que nos estemos siempre en comunicación para poder entender, y, o sea, saber de lo que pasa en nuestro país. Muchas gracias. So, time is very limited. Don Benjamín and Roddy, Brett, thank you very much, both of you. Muchísimas gracias. Sí.